Another season of the Overwatch League has come and gone. You know what that means. It's time for the annual return of the best player on every hero list. Today I'm giving you my personal best player on every character on the Overwatch roster from Overwatch League 2022. If you're new to the channel, here's a quick rundown of how these kinds of videos tend to work. I'll be going through every hero in the entire game and picking one, yes, just one player who I thought was generally the most impactful on said hero during the year. I'll give you an idea of what my eyes told me and any statistics to back it up when I find it necessary. Every player who touched the stage this year is fair game and this includes people who retired mid-season or got released. Oh, and players are only going to be eligible for a certain hero if they actually use them during the 2022 season. Their past is completely irrelevant in that regard. And of course, if you enjoyed this video and you want more just like it, definitely hit like and subscribe and leave a comment with your own list down below. Traditionally, we start this videos with tanks, so first up is of course D.Va. And unlike previous years, this one is kind of a toughie. D.Va was pretty irrelevant overall compared to previous years, so there's not exactly a clear winner, but I'm going to be saying Hawk is my best D.Va of 2022. He generally didn't have a ton of competition, but I did enjoy Hawk's D.Va play a lot as he had the most playtime on her by far, and it felt like the rain got the most out of it. Anytime Hawk ran the D.Va comp, Atlanta's chances of victory went way up. They posted a 4-2 record during the one and only D.Va meta with a 51% teamfight win rate percentage which is good enough for second place in the league. And considering Hawk was posting the best overall numbers on her, I'd say that's more than enough reason to give him the title of Best Diva. And now, for the first time ever in one of these videos, we're covering Doomfist at the tank roll. And for me, there's only one option. It's gotta be Dante all the way, baby. Some other Doom players might have put up the better stats and have maybe even won more games, but Dante's Doom meant the most to his team's success in the first half of 2022. While other teams were maybe playing more of the standard stuff in between their Doom, Houston kind of stuck with the Doom partially because it really did work for them and Dante was that good. And what I find the most impressive with Dante is he did more with less. Some other teams out there that were obviously better could barely even post a better stat or win rate than him. Dante's individual and team value on Doom has no equal. Reiner and Hawk deserve a shout out for being pretty good themselves, but the Outlaw stuck with this Doomfist composition for longer than anybody else and they found greater success. Dante actually gained quite the reputation as a Doom player in 2022, and for good reason. Speaking of newer concepts at tank, next is gonna be Junker Queen, and this one is really not even close. It's just Hanbin over and over. It was painfully clear how much better Hanbin was than everybody else on Queen. The few were arguably at their most dominant this year during the Junker Queen meta, and it is largely thanks to Hanbin's greater understanding of the hero compared to his competition. He is the biggest example of what it looks like to be a carry Junker Queen. There's just so many individual acts of brilliance that completely turn a game in Dallas's favor. I want you to keep in mind that some tank players have more playtime than him on Queen, but Hanbin still leads the way in total damage numbers, and he has averages that are way better by a significant margin. The Hanbin Junker Queen is simply built different, and there's nobody else you could possibly pick. Time for Orisa. She's a pretty irrelevant hero, so there's not exactly much to discuss. But in terms of who got the most out of her, I would actually lean towards Dante. The Outlaws ran that Orisa bunker strat a couple of times during the playoffs and Countdown Cup, and it worked pretty well. With the highest damage rate and the lowest death count, you can make a pretty good case for him here. Again, it's not like it really matters considering how irrelevant she was, but Dante's Orisa on control did help Houston win a couple of big playoff games, which is more than anybody else on this list could possibly say. Next is gonna be Reinhardt. And if you're not going with Hottie, then what are you doing? There's just no other realistic option. Hottie was the leader behind London's rush comp, which was their iconic bread and butter. And anytime somebody attempted to match him, Hottie and the boys would put him in their place. Not a lot of teams put stock into the rhyme this year, this is true, but London certainly did, and they made it work. They made it something that was unique to them. They embraced the Chad nature of Hottie, and it took them pretty darn far. And the fact that he was dying the least on over 9 hours of playtime is pretty wild. Hottie's rhyme was simply built different, he is the undisputed king. Now we're on to Roadhog, and only a few teams even attempted to use him at all, and for good reason, right? He sucked. 
But one team did find some success when the lights were at their brightest, and that would be the Houston Outlaws, which means that by default, Dante is going to win the privilege of best hog as well. Dante and Houston had a viable strat on Busan during the playoffs, and the hog actually did find some high value, netting them a convincing round victory over the Toronto Defiant. The Toronto dive stood absolutely zero chance against Dante as he landed a couple of key hooks. Nobody really played hog for as long as Dante did, and nobody had the strat at work for a long period of time either in a meaningful scenario, so by default, I say we give this to Dante. But enough about that. How about a more relevant hero, like Sigma let's say? While the league certainly had its fair share of elite players on this hero, I find it very difficult to not pick Kaluj. Kaluj always seemed to diff the opposition whenever that SIG comp got busted out, and I mean this was against literally everybody, even the best SIG players in the entire world. The Shock were specifically extremely tough to stop with the Sigma Circuit Royale composition, and Kaluj was essentially the leader of it. He was really good with building up that flux really fast, and the amount of pressure that he put on enemy teams was absolutely suffocating. Among all players with two or more hours of playtime on SIG, he led the league in damage, eliminations, and with the smallest death rate per 10. His SIG was a absolute nightmare. People talk about how scary it was to deal with Violet and Finn in this scenario, but Kaluj might have been the guy who truly made the comp as potent as it was. He so clearly had the edge over every other tank. And considering how many talented and historic SIG players we have seen in this league that are still here right now, that's a pretty crazy feat. Looking into Winston, there's a pretty painful choice to make. Smurf or Fearless. They were both very good for two different reasons, but for me, I'm actually going to lead towards Smurf in what could be seen as a hot take here. It's no hate towards Fearless, I thought he was absolutely insane, but generally, Smurf's Winston performances seem to be more significant over the span of the year. Fearless had some great moments during the playoffs, which don't get me wrong, is very important. But it's not like this was the only time Winston was relevant, and a lot of the other times it often felt like Dallas just weren't doing as good on the monkey comp compared to Zarya or whatever else. It's not necessarily Fearless's fault, but Smurf overall had a more memorable Winston. I'm looking at the year as a whole, don't only think about the playoffs. Smurf's Winston was huge in Soul's Kickoff Clash title, and it continued to be reliable for the rest of the year. Smurf genuinely had a lot of carry moments on the monkey this year. His primal mechanics were arguably the best in the Overwatch League. But aside from the carries, I thought that his Winston generally meant the most to his specific team. He had really solid coordination with his dives, like way better than his counterparts usually. He did the dirty work, he had the carries, he has the stats, and the flashiness. What else could you really ask for? Now from a good dive hero to, well, a not as relevant one. Who on earth do we pick for Wrecking Ball? For a while, I went back and forth between Fate and Belos Rhea. Those were my standouts. But in the end, I decided to settle on Belos Rhea. While individually, Fate could be seen as maybe the more desirable ball player, Philly got more use out of their ball with better results. That crazy mid-season madness loser's bracket run saw Bellos Rhea play ball like every single game, and among those matches, he had multiple 20-plus elim games with very few deaths. He was really good at staying out of trouble while maximizing his value with the pile driver and making some huge plays on his own on the back line. The pace of the game became very chaotic, and Philly thrived from it. The Fusion are that one team I can think of that got major use out of the hero both in qualifiers and in a tournament setting at the same time. It was a composition that was very unique to Philly, and Belos Rio gave them an identity. Now for the final tank, Zarya. I mean, if you're not picking Hanbin, I have questions. Hanbin demolished everybody in his path. The amount of damage that he was pumping out is the big X factor that gave Dallas a clear edge during two different stages. There were times where he genuinely felt unstoppable. Dallas was winning a little under 60% of their team fights, when including the Zarya, and keep in mind that Hanbin played her for over 9 hours. That is a ridiculous rate of success for individual team fights. And generally speaking, when the fuel did commit to Hanbin on the Zarya, the LA Gladiators and like Houston one separate time were pretty much the only teams to crack the code. In other words, when the fuel busted out Hanbin on the Zarya, it was rare to see them lose. Everything from his damage output to bubble timings were perfect 
perfection. It's pretty much half the reason why he almost won an MVP this year. Hanbin wins best Zarya in a landslide. And that does it for tanks. On to DPS. First is Ash. And in a weird year where Sojourn was the primary long-ranged character to play, some teams tried to throw in the Ash, usually with not a ton of success. One person to go against that norm, though, was Hisu. He played the hero the most by far of any player, and when you look at how he played, it's for good reason. That Summer Showdown meta saw Hisu do some disgusting things. It was a real strat that Toronto could afford to run because Hisu really was that good. If you're in a world where you can get away with playing Ash over Sojourn, you've got to be doing something right. And they were outright winning the hitscan battle throughout the entire Summer Showdown, it felt like. It takes serious skill to do that when you're straight up playing a worse hero arguably. Hisu consistently pumped out over 10k damage per 10 minutes and got the most out of the dynamite in that close quarters brawl meta. Given that everybody else was usually a slave to other heroes, I'd say that this gives Hisu a serious edge. Now for our boy Bastion. Let's keep it short and sweet. Nobody played him for even 10 minutes, but if we're defaulting to who found the most value, I'd say that proper's your winner. Remember when he absolutely ran over the titans on Circuit Royale? Yeah, that's why he gets the honors here. Six kills in one death in three minutes is pretty insane for Bastion standards. Proper is probably the biggest example that we have, this year at least, of Bastion domination. Third up is Cassidy. He was not much of a viable hitscan this year, so he doesn't get much of a spotlight overall, but there is one cast player that I remember being somewhat dominant in a genuine planned composition. It happened early on during this year, but MN3 made some pretty good plays on hybrid maps. He had some crazy pop-offs, netting a ridiculous 15 final blows and 2 solo kills per 10 minutes. Nobody really has the same feats on the same amount of playtime, you know? Philly arguably got the most out of Cassidy this year, and MN3 was a shining star that deserves this award. There's not much else to say, so let's look into Echo. While not quite as relevant this year, we actually did see quite a few elite Echo players. Proper, Zest, Alpha Yi, Becky, Speedily, among others. But for me, the king is still going to remain Pelican. Pelican used it as a staple in Houston's game plan in the early season and looked damn good on her. Pelican had the perfect understanding of when to be aggressive and when not to, and generally just had the better understanding of this hero than most. Out of anybody who genuinely played Echo a lot this year, nobody really compares with taking over a game. I'd say that someone like Becky, for example, maybe comes close, but Pelican generally had the most clutch feats, the best stats, and better ult usage, which is why I lean towards him as the league's best Echo. Now for a hero that will surely spark some debate. Genji. With how relevant he was in 2022, there were naturally a ton of shining stars. Some might say it has to be proper for what he did. Others will tell you it's Prophet, Pelican, Sparkle, etc. But in my eyes, the league's number one Genji player is Who Are You? Aside from being really strong individually, he genuinely made his mark for the dragons anytime this hero was a must-have in a composition. His Genji was the thing that completed them, in a sense. Anytime he took the starting mantle, this team looked a lot more confident in their play. And in general, the team seemed to miss the Genji legend anytime he was benched. I don't know if there's another Genji player in the league where it seems like a team is just way more confident than they are when they don't have him on Genji, because even some of the top teams in the league still did find success with a secondary playmaker on the Genji. But the Dragons truly needed Who Are You on him. He is a huge reason why their Summer Showdown title was even possible, so I for one feel pretty comfortable giving him this honor. Now for the less relevant Shimada brother, Hanzo. Now, with the little we saw of him, you could maybe just go with Pelican for what he did on Coliseo that one time, but one play should not be the deciding factor, and when you go off overall Hansel play, I actually prefer Profit. In one hour, he posted a whopping 10.9 final blows per 10. Prophet has one huge moment against the Hongzhou Spark that's pretty defining on Ilios, but unlike a lot of his competition, the memorable feats don't just stop there. He had multiple really strong showings where it felt like he could not stop hitting shots, and his domination with Hanzo even helped the Dynasty close out a playoff game against the Florida Mayhem. Prophet showed us time after time that he still has what it takes on this hero, even after five years of utilizing. 
replacing him. He basically did everything that you want in a top Hanzo, so that's why I'm going with him. But if you thought that Hanzo was irrelevant, just wait until we talk about Junkrat. With nobody playing him for over 7 minutes, you kinda just have to YOLO it. And that honor will belong to Checkmate. Out of all players to use Junk, he's probably the guy with the most memorable performance, as he absolutely rolled over Dallas on Nepal Sanctum. The gameplay you see is not very flashy, but he did happen to lead all Junk players in kills, so this is as good as it gets. The strat certainly did catch the fuel off guard, and Checkmate was able to show some good frags as he had a nice little 8-in-1 performance for himself that round. And considering that not many teams actually found success in general utilizing Junk, that's good enough for me. Next is May. And it's pretty hard to not go with Backbone, as he was an important part of London's rush composition with her. It was his job to land the critical walls and help save Hottie's skin, and it played out very well. It wasn't anything out of this world per se, but Backbone's May did get the job done. He played a ton of her this year in London's feature comp and was a star component of it. The wall usage, along with the low death rate and blizzard efficiency, were solid. He's really good across the board, which is something that much of his comp competition is missing. Now, maybe Pelican could have gotten this honor if he played more, but Backbone just has a way bigger pool of performances to judge, which is why he ultimately takes home the title of Best May. Pharah is going to be our next target, and once again, there's not much to base this on. Pharah was pretty irrelevant overall, often being a map-specific strategy, but one man who seemed to make it work on a couple of different occasions across various maps was Jinmu. Was he anything out of this world? No. But the fact that Chengdu were like the only team to play her on various control and hybrid maps and find success is good enough for me. Most teams couldn't win with her outside of like Lijiang Gardens, you know? But in his 37 minutes on Farah, Jinmu was able to bring a couple of different bright spots across a couple of different maps, so why not? Next is gonna be the Reaper guy, and for a while, I went back and forth. Edison or Striker? Edison or Striker? But then it hit me. Edison was great, but during a time when not a lot of other teams were utilizing Reaper. But Striker was solid when literally everybody considered him to be a must pick. So for that reason, I chose to go with Striker. We talk about what Proper did for the Shock during the playoffs, but Striker definitely deserves credit as well. He had countless playoff games where he'd close out maps or keep his team in a game with a well-placed Death Blossom. I know other people had their sick moments where they'd get their 5Ks and other things, but the main difference is, is that Striker's big moments usually came when the lights were at their brightest. And that's the stuff you're going to remember, right? Whenever his team needed him the most, he usually stepped up. That huge Death Blossom on map 7 against the Dallas Fuel is a prime example. Striker will consistently outplay just about anybody that gets in his way. We saw it with Pelican, Alpha Yee, Sparkle, Fleta, Prophet. He put up some high KD games against all of them. And while he wasn't necessarily the best statistically or even the flashiest, he was definitely the most clutch. Hence why Striker wins Best Reaper for me. Now for a big one. It's so Jurin time, baby. For the longest time, this was easily the biggest challenge for me, as there's a lot of players that can make a great case. Merit, Hydron, Lip, Edison, Sparker, Shy, the list goes on, they're all standouts. But after what we witnessed in the playoffs, my answer just has to be proper. In general, he was very good at Sojourn, both during the playoffs and throughout the regular season, but then he proceeded to solidify himself over the competition with one of the greatest playoff runs in the history of professional over. Overwatch. What he did in those playoffs should not be legal. I really wanted to go with Shy for a long time, he was just so good with his solo carries, but what Proper did just takes the mini of carry to a new level. Look at the stats for crying out loud, he literally averaged 1k more damage than Shy at second place. 1,000! And if you want another crazy number, Proper had 9 Fleta deadlifts and a bunch of others that nearly hit the mark. He consistently got half his team's final blows or more in single maps and nobody else even comes close. Do you know how often the Shock want to fight if Proper got the first kill on Sojourn? 
86% of the time. That's like unheard of. His ability to find timely picks was literally game changing. When you are clearly the best and most important player in the game every single time because of what you're doing on a hero, it is really hard to go against you. Proper literally checks off all of the boxes while doing things we have never seen before. He's just an absolute freak of nature. That's enough about Sojourn, so now it's time for Soldier 76. It was a bit short-lived, but for once he was a staple in a meta, and in spite of the character's simplicity, plenty of guys played the hero to absolute perfection. But when it's all said and done, I'll be going with Patty Pan as my best soldier. Technically, he did retire before this year ended, but I still feel obligated to pick him based on the Gladiator's kickoff clash run. If you don't count Patty, which is understandable, it's pretty hard to go wrong with like Lip, Merit, or Hisu, but I'ma pick Patty. Aside from matching these other guys statistically, Patty felt like a stronger playmaker in the clutch. I saw him as a closer for this Gladiator's team. He always seemed to be in the right place at the right time, leading to easy cleanup and mowing down squishies. His tracking was simply divine. He was the guy I often remember going crazy in those big time map closing situations, sometimes without the need for a pocket or nano boost. Just classic, great tracking, and timely positioning. Other guys come close mechanically, but they either didn't do as much when it mattered, or were not one of the most important guys for their team's success. Patty Pan had both, which is why I'm going with him. Let us shift our focus to Sombra. Through her erratic playtime, it always felt like one guy stood above the rest of the pack. The best Sombra of 2022 was Doha. Lots of people played her for a lot longer this year, but Doha dominated with her at her highest point of relevance during the Countdown Cup. Not only did Dallas go 5-1 in this qualifier partially thanks to Doha's resourceful Sombra, but he was also the top player statistically by a good amount. First in solo kills, first in elims, second in final blows, he did it all by himself and through setting up his teammates. He heavily outpaced the opposition with EMP charge and his general EMP efficiency. His manual hacks and assassinations were very much on point. He generally made the most out of Sombra's rework this year through a combination of her old style and and a new one. Doha made the enemy's lives a living nightmare, and if you're doing that on Sombra, you're playing her correctly. When looking into Symmetra, you kind of just have to go with the flow in terms of who had the greatest success on a specific strat, as she saw very rare use this year. And for me, that person's gonna be Easy Han. Easy Han is probably the best example I can think of of a Sim looking pretty strong on control maps. He played Sim a decent bit in the Philly series during the Countdown Cup, making it work not only on Oasis, but also on Nepal in that same game. He made a notable difference for the Valiant's ability to hold a point and play Rush effectively, and that one time playing Sim did give the Valiant two map-defining wins, which really is not something anybody else can say that played Sim. He got big value out of a pretty niche hero, so good on him. Sticking on those pesky one-trick heroes we all get annoyed by in our ranked games, we have Torbjörn. I wish I could say that people actually used him because he can be fun to watch, but seeing the dwarf was a pretty rare instance. But of the people People who dared to touch him, Alpha Yi stands out the most for what it's worth. For a brief period in the kickoff clash, Alpha Yi would full send the Torb on midtown defense. And genuinely, he didn't look half bad. He threw out a couple of solid holds on point A and even had a couple of frags. And what's cool is that his Torb win rate is like 50%. It actually resulted in a couple of map wins for the Spark. For a short time, he made the Torbjörn viable in a year where nobody else really cared for him. Enough about these irrelevant heroes that none of us care for. It's Tracer time. Given his carry antics on her throughout this entire year, I'd say that Proper locks this up by a small margin. His Tracer definitely was the most impactful in terms of making a difference for his team. The likes of Kevster and Prophet are very close behind, but when it's all said and done, it felt like Proper lifted his team up the most through the plays he made. And unlike a lot of these other guys, Proper didn't have that consistent second option lining up next to him. He arguably carried more and put up better stats with less help. The stats are just insane. To put it into perspective, Proper's teamfight win rate on Tracer led all DPS players at 53%. And keep in mind that Tracer was played the most when teams like Soul and the Gladiators were winning tournaments. Proper kept his team in contention always on the Tracer with some dominant showings. It's pretty hard to get deadlifts as a Tracer player, but Proper went out there and found a way to do it. In my opinion, no Tracer was stronger individually than Proper. Other guys maybe had slightly 
slightly higher success rates on the year, but no individual could really match proper. He did the most by himself while still managing to outpace the elite tracers in better situations. Dude was an absolute monster. You get the point though, I'm a real sucker for proper's tracer. So let's get into the final DPS of the roster, aka Widowmaker. If there is one guy that I truly appreciated on Widow this year, it's MM3. He was so precise with his aim, you know? He was so deadly and so dangerous that teams were literally afraid of him. They would change the entire way they'd engage a fight because they were scared of getting picked off. And understandably so. He made even some of the most dangerous teams in the East become passive, and he was arguably the best Widow Duelist in the league on top of it all. When you're fragging, completely shutting down the enemy snipers, and controlling the game through fear, you make yourself a really good case. Nobody, I mean absolutely nobody, could take over a game when hot on the Widowmaker better than MN3. Some players from APAC last year even publicly said that he is the best Widow. You have to be really really insane to get other hitscans to admit defeat and acknowledge you, so MN3 just has to win the best widow. And that does it for DPS. Let's close it out with the support. Let's talk about Ana. We saw a lot of skill with this hero. People like Shu, Twilight, Ultraviolet, Finn, and Iris were all models of consistency on her. In the end though, I lean more towards Fielder as the true king, as he has the right combination of high healing and setting up his teammates without sacrificing positioning. He doesn't take too many risks and he keeps the mistakes to a minimum. With just over 5 deaths and 10k healing per 10, Fielder has the ideal balanced mindset while still helping to put his team in a better position to win through his own plays. His efficiency can only be matched by very few in this league. I absolutely love the way that Fielder plays Ana. He prioritizes the team, but will carry when he has to if he sees some sort of opening. Fielder has the ideal on a playstyle, which is why I have to go with him. Speaking of ideal playstyles, we're on to Baptiste. It might be a new year, but Chu still comes out on top. Honorable mentions can go out to like Fielder, Violet, RuPaul, Crimzo, and Landon. I think all of them are very respectable, but Chu went absolutely crazy. On one hand, his healing rates were definitely below average. On the other, he made up for it by essentially being a third DPS on a regular basis. For like a less than average amount of healing, she was a primary playmaker that put extra pressure on the enemy DPS. There's other people who did the damage too, of course, but the way they got it came in less impactful situations, I feel. She was there for cleanup, but also soloing people himself, as he ranked number one in solo kills per 10. She was the guy whose bap you always seem to remember based off of all of the highlights. That's the difference between him and people who might have played the hero a bit longer. It might seem a little selfish to prioritize the damage over the heals, but that's what worked for the gladiators. It's what they needed, and they won a ton of games from it. When push comes to shove, when things were coming down to the wire usually, somebody aside from the usual suspect just has to step up and make a move if you want to win, and Shu always seemed to be that guy. In a playmaking competition on Baptiste, Shu goes unmatched over the length of an entire game. Let's check out Brigitte now. I may have a bit of a hot take depending on who you're talking to here. My best Brig of 2022 is Skewed. The Glads were losers a lot of the time when Brig was at her most popular. I get that. But Skewed might have been the biggest reason they weren't getting blown out during the Summer Showdown in the first place. If anything, his excellence shining through when his team couldn't compete only gives him a better case. It's hard to look good on a hero like Brigitte when your team is struggling. His statistics were still top tier across the board in spite of that though. Top on damage, lowest death rate, top 4 in healing, top 4 in elims. In a bad situation where he was genuinely losing more than he won, Skew still dominated. He just understands this hero. He knows how to be opportunistic without sacrificing positioning. He keeps that Inspire passive up consistently and the death rate to a minimum. Over a 50% win rate in spite of the Glad's horrible summer showdown is wild. Skew did more with way less, arguably. The winners at main support are the guys you usually pay attention to, right? It's just easier for them to stand out because they're not feeding and their team's not struggling. So the fact that Skewed was still a standout player is wild. Next, we get into some new territory. Kiriko. 
We had just one meta to understand what goes into being great at this hero, but a lot of guys brought out the absolute best in her regardless. For a while, I was pretty torn between Fielder and Teru, as they both had pretty desirable traits with drastically different styles. But ultimately, I prefer Teru personally. I'm a big fan of supports who try to take charge themselves. He didn't heal nearly as much as somebody like Fielder, which can be a real turnoff for some, but the Spark still did make it work, did they not? And he was arguably more important to his team's success than Fielder with Dallas. You don't necessarily need to be heal-oriented if you play your cards right and you play intelligently, which is exactly what Taro did. He knew how to get the most out of her damage-wise, you know? His really aggro positioning showed how to stretch this hero to the absolute limit of her capabilities. You take these crazy angles and you use your mechanics and your cooldowns to try and completely throw an enemy team off guard. It led to the high highest kill rate of any Kiriko in the Overwatch League, and if you think he's playing recklessly or too selfishly, then think again. He was tied with Fielder for the lowest death rate in the league, showing that he knew exactly what he was doing. He was really effective at giving the Spark that extra man advantage in fights just because he was doing so much more than other supports that he was going up against. In my opinion, Teru was the best player mechanically, and he understood how to try and get the most out of this character and her potential. There's nothing wrong with focusing on heals, don't get me wrong, but the character can do so much more to me in Taro is absolute proof of what you can do. Speaking of fast playing supports, Lucio is up next on our list, and while I really appreciate the efforts of people like Funny Astro for example, I felt absolutely no pain whatsoever in selecting Chio as the league's best Lucio. In my opinion, Chio was the best combination of aggressive and intelligent. He came in and largely helped guide the pace of a Dallas team full of stars. But that's not all, right? He was known for making the most plays in the clutch compared to other Lucio players. Anytime he stepped up his game, it always resulted in some sort of big boop, kill setup, or fight-altering sound barrier. And in a world where support just isn't what it used to be, it takes a lot of effort to make your presence this well-known. Chio's Lucio was an underlooked aspect of what made Dallas so great. Somebody like Violet or Funny Astro were pretty aggressive and maybe did more healing, but Chio made more of his opportunities while making arguably more solo plays, staying alive longer, and doing a better job of guiding his team. Chio was top level in every single way, and I couldn't possibly think of a better person to select. Now to take care of a couple of, well niche picks. The first of which is Mercy, and for the sake of this hero being pretty irrelevant, let's just give it to Nisha. Statistically, Nisha was pretty solid across the board. He's not like Yveltal, or I guess I should say Xerneas levels of flashy, but he did manage to get the second highest win rate on the second highest playtime with multiple zero death rounds for what it's worth. He played smart and out of trouble while boosting Jinmu with that blue beam so he could do his thing on fair effectively. Nobody else played Mercy this year, but she does always find some sort of way to be useful useful in Chengdu's comms. Nisha did what he was asked to do, and he stayed out of trouble while boosting his teammates. There's really not much else you can ask for. The second irrelevant hero to cover is Moira. A little playtime here and there during the early season is all we really got of her, and of those moments, I tend to think that Finn took advantage of it the most. He did an excellent job of keeping his teammates nice and healthy during some big control maps and got pretty good use of that coalescence. Also, his stats were pretty good, so why not? He led the league in healing and damage per 10 with the lowest death rate amongst anyone with at least an hour of playtime on her. He was efficient by every metric in the book and has the clutch feats to back it up. But who really cares? It's Moira for crying out loud. I'd much rather talk about our final hero of this video, aka Zenyatta. A bunch of guys played this hero the exact way you'd prefer. But man, Izayaki absolutely stands above the rest of the pack. Izzy had the best stats in the league by far in my eyes, and was often a solo carry for a Dragons team in a year where they didn't have a clear number two option. When Zenyatta was viable, Izayaki became that guy, which is impressive when considering how much more important DPS and tank were this year. Other great zens like Finn and Violet were mostly standouts on the double flex support bunker comp, and were kind of just doing enough at times, but Izayaki often felt like he was going above and beyond. Izzy was doing it in pretty much every meta you could think of, while continuously being more bloodthirsty than the rest of his competition. His first pick rate was one of the best in the entire league, and his team was winning 
about 80% of the time off of said picks. He gave the Dragons a lot of life during the mid and late season when Zen was at his most playable, and he did so on a measly 5 deaths per 10, which is pretty good for Zen Yada. His play was so widely recognized by the Overwatch League on Zen that he even won a roll star for it. So for all that, I feel pretty comfortable giving the title of number one Zen to Izayaki. And, well, that's pretty much it. There you go. That's my best player on every hero in Overwatch League Season 5. That was a lot. Congrats if you made it to the end of this video. If you're still watching right now, you're the real MVP. But regardless, I hope you did enjoy this video. If you did, it would mean so much to me if you could hit that like button. Let's try and boost that algorithm so we can get lots of people to watch this. Let's get the word out. And if this is your first time watching around here, definitely consider hitting that subscribe button as I make Overwatch League content just like this every single week. And as always, thank you all so much for your love and support on these videos. They always do so well and I really appreciate Appreciate it. And until next time, this is ATP signing out. Peace.